Hello everyone and happy Halloween if you're watching this right when it comes out. My name is Jacob. I'm a senior story analyst with Slated and this holiday season I thought it'd be cool to analyze some of the storytelling techniques from one of the most Halloween-esque filmmakers out there and the man who inspired me to wear Picos throughout high school, Tim Burton. As you're probably aware, Tim Burton is known for his distinct gothic style and his regular focus on unloved outcasts. But despite the entertainment value automatically built in these defining qualities, some have suggested that his films have become a parody of his own style, or that the scripts themselves lack the masterful storytelling techniques you see in his earlier work. And there's no doubt that if you compare Burton's beloved classics with some of the recent films that were less critically successful, there are some differences. So let's take a look at some of the techniques that Tim Burton uses in his classic and highly acclaimed films that could universally be applied across different genres and in your own writing. This is the one I'll be remembered. One central quality that separates Burton's beloved earlier work is that it's clear why he as a filmmaker has chosen that particular premise or theme. It's worth noting that on a lot of his films, Tim Burton has a story credit, which means he could have originated the original idea or worked with a writer for the foundational decision making, but in each case, his point of view on the subject matter is crystal clear. It's funny, with most of the script submissions I read, it's easy to tell when the writer's heart is in the story and when it's clear that they're not sure what they're trying to say in the first place. As with many filmmakers earlier in their career, Burton seemed to have a whole lot to say. This gothic outcast culture was far from trendy in the beginning of his career, so centering his stories around this lovable dark outcast felt fresh and bold. On top of that, he actively used his films to reflect some of the biggest things he learned in life growing up in the suburbs in Burbank, California. For instance, Beetlejuice and Edward Scissorhands provide a humorous critique on gentrification and an inauthentic culture that stifles uniqueness. That's then challenged in a satisfying way when the likable protagonist is introduced. My favorite film of his, Ed Wood, also seems to clearly reflect his feelings on the beauty of boldly pursuing a quirky artistic vision, no matter how naive or uncommercial it may seem. This message makes for a memorable thematic backbone to the story not only because it has a lot of truth to it, but also is coming from a place of personal passion and experience that's unique to Burton and the screenwriters Scott Alexander and Larry Karaszewski. And then when you look at some of Burton's later work, like Alice in Wonderland, Miss Peregrine's Home for Peculiar Children, and Dumbo, sure there are themes and it's visually delightful, but they don't seem to be saying anything very memorable or fresh or unique or personal to the filmmakers. Their heart and purpose seems to be lost within a premise that's more by the book. Of course, these were adaptations and made into large tentpole releases, but even when adapting stories, there's so much room for writers to discover what's uniquely drawing them to the premise and what sort of unique perspective they as an individual could offer on this internal journey, rather than just providing something more external and surface leveled and full of tropes. And the purpose doesn't always have to be themed. Sometimes filmmakers and writers choose to make something just because they solely want to entertain audiences in a bold and over-the-top way. That's fine too, and it could also feel personal, which we'll talk about next. At last, my arm is complete again. Mars Attacks, Pee-Wee's Big Adventure, Sleepy Hollow, and Sweeney Todd don't really say anything too unique or thematically resonant. But they still answer the question, why this premise, by saying, let's go a little over the top and do the wildness of the story justice. When it's clear that the filmmakers are having fun with the story at hand and are really unleashing their creativity in a defining way, the viewers can really feel and appreciate that. Even though Sweeney Todd was a successful stage play and musical, pairing Tim Burton's tonal inclinations and style seemed to be a match made in heaven. Who better to direct a dark comedic film about a vengeful Victorian age London barber who kills his customers and turns them into meat pies? And they made a film that was so over the top, visually distinct, and artistic that the naturally off-putting premise felt like a fun and sometimes beautiful art piece. If another writer and director were to come along and try to make something more subtle and maybe even thematically moving off the dark source material of either Sweeney Todd or Sleepy Hollow, I feel the pitch itself might be too difficult for viewers to stomach which is why some iterations of films like The Phantom of the Opera and Dorian Gray also left many viewers disappointed. In some of Burton's recent big budget projects, you might notice that the tone feels a little less effective. It almost seems like the kiss of death for Tim Burton films is when the film has a huge budget and is also rated PG or PG-13. When that happens, studios seem to expect the film to appeal more to families in order to get a return on that huge financial investment. As a result, the writers and filmmakers' hands are kind of forced not to go too outlandish with the comedy to the point where it feels too niche, nor too dark to the point of the film earning an R rating. And what you end up with is a lot of story beats and internal conflicts and jokes that feel force-fed so that younger audience can still appreciate the film. Oh, how the ruling class remain 
ruling class. Exactly what I've been saying. This family could use some balls. Again, this isn't a critique on the creatives involved as there's not much you could do when the studio forces your hand, but it's clear how effective an unrestricted tonal approach could be to the story if it derives from the passion of the filmmaker. For instance, when Burton remade Frank and Weenie in 2012, the low budget gave him the freedom to pursue more tonally and stylistically niche choices including stop motion, an entirely black and white story world, and a not so child friendly pitch involving a story driven by the death of a dog. Did it make as much as Dumbo? Not even close. But from a story perspective, it seems it was far more critically acclaimed, viewers had a better time, which is the whole point of this, and it even pulled out an Oscar nomination. This town is more than any man could ask for, but the truth is, I'm just not ready to end up anywhere. But no one's ever left! One of the defining characteristics of a successful Tim Burton film is the either wildly colorful or purposefully desaturated but still intensely creative story world. And whereas some people might dismiss the story world as something visual and object-based, the Burton films that truly shine tend to treat the story world as its own character. As mentioned, the vibrant cookie-cutter town in Edward Scissorhands was so defined and had a distinct shared culture that it in itself felt like a character. Its colors, pristine fakeness, and sense of absolute order and security contrasted perfectly with the dark yet authentic character of Edward Scissorhands. And as such, the story world and the neighbors populating it travel through as much of an arc as any other major character in the film when introduced to Edward's unique behaviors and perspective. Also, Burton's Batman and Batman Returns are often hailed for being some of the first Batman films to seemingly make the city of Gotham into its own character, giving it its own unique identity and culture and paving the way for the franchise moving forward. These story worlds were explored as deeply and internally as a character, revealing the same level of conflict and potential arts within a community as one would expect from the lead character. When you look at some of Burton's later work, the story worlds are visually vibrant, but they don't seem to represent or convey anything that's specifically internal or thematic. This brings us to our final point. Not only do a lot of Tim Burton's beloved films have an intensely defined and absurd story world, but they also follow a naive, innocent, and abnormal protagonist introduced into that story world. Most scripts I read that have a sense of absurdity or a fantasy within the story world fall into one of two categories. They follow a normal protagonist within an abnormal story world, or an abnormal protagonist within a realistic or normal story world. This could definitely work in horror or comedy or fantasy because it gives viewers a sense of perspective. However, Burton films tend to increase their sense of whimsy and originality by having both the story world and the protagonist be abnormal when compared to our modern reality, and yet still provide intriguing contrast between the story world and the characters. This combo makes the story extra interesting because viewers get the benefit of a fish out of water story while still having a character who is incredibly unique, flawed, and memorable. The level of whimsy and fantasy are truly heightened to the next level while still giving viewers someone to invest in, as anyone can relate to the feeling of being an outcast or being in a new environment. Nightmare Before Christmas, produced by Tim Burton, is probably the easiest film to spot this pattern. It's not about a kid from our world who stumbles onto Christmas Town. If it were, that would still provide some contrast and fantasy. But what makes the film extremely memorable is its beloved protagonist, Jack Skeleton, who is from a world of perpetual Halloween. Forcing him into a new environment gives viewers the fun perspective of an outlandish lead character, while still allowing them to feel internally connected to this feeling of discovering a world neither they nor Jack Skeleton have experienced before. And Burton films encourage this personal connection to the strange protagonist, not only by making them naive, but also full of love and innocence. And this combo of a protagonist who is innocent and ultra unique seems to be the magic formula behind some of Burton's greatest films. When a character is innocent and sweet but a little generic, their perspective and arc is somewhat overpowered by the story world. When they are unique but lack any potential for love, it could be difficult to care about their internal journey or arc. Now none of these ideas objectively define what makes a good script or film. There are many contradictions of these traits within Burton's own filmography. And I bet there are some people out there who loved Dumbo or his Planet of the Apes remake. But without a doubt, there are a number of Tim Burton films that are widely beloved and remembered even after all these years. And most of these share some great, universal, evergreen qualities that could be considered for any writer's work. I hope you enjoyed that last video, and if you'd like our team at Slated to review your script, you can check out the link in the description, learn all about Slated's patented three-reader script analysis, and if you like screenwriting or film finance content like this, don't forget to subscribe. Until next time, happy writing.